In this video, we study a really neat application of tangent measures to harmonic measure, the two-phase problem. We saw in the earlier video that if harmonic measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Hausdorff measure, that implies harmonic measure is actually rectifiable, and so the boundary of its domain contains a rectifiable subset of positive measure. Now, what if instead we had two harmonic measures on disjoint domains, and they were mutually absolutely continuous with respect to each other on some subset of the intersection of their boundaries? What kind of structural information does this give us? Or what does it tell us about the geometry of the boundaries of these domains? So using complex analysis, this problem was studied by Bishop, Carl Carlson, Garnett, and Jones for simply connected domains in the complex plane. So they show that if the two harmonic measures were mutually absolutely continuous on some subset E of the intersection of their boundaries, then uh, almost every point with respect to one dimensional Hausdorff measure in this subset E is not a tangent point from the boundary, meaning that the boundaries of these domains do not concentrate around any line as we zoom in at one of these points. So uh, what this also implies then is that if these two measures are mutually absolutely continuous, then we can find a one rectifiable subset of positive measure inside their boundary. It was conjectured by Bishop that something similar should be true for domains in higher dimensions, but because their proof in the plane relied on complex analysis, newer techniques were required for this problem. About 20 years later, a breakthrough on this problem was found by Kenig, Price, and Toro. So they showed that for two complementary NTA domains, if their harmonic measures were mutually absolutely continuous on their common boundary, then the tangent measures of the harmonic measures are flat at almost every point in their common boundary. So this was a big leap towards solving the previous problem, since while it doesn't yet imply rectifiability, it still gives us some geometric information about the boundary. So in particular, one can show that as we zoom in at almost any point on the boundary with respect to harmonic measure, not only is the harmonic measure beginning to get flatter and resemble a flat measure, but the boundary itself is getting flatter and flatter. However, it may not uh, a priori, it may not necessarily be converging towards one plane. The domain could still be spiraling as we zoom in on it, but still getting flatter and flatter. So this is a phenomenon much like Price's theorem, where we started out with some simple measure theoretic assumptions, in this case, the mutual absolute continuity of these two harmonic measures. And from that, we learn about the actual shape of the boundary as we zoom in. So later on, the full conjecture of Bishop was resolved for general domains in Euclidean space. So in fact, any two domains whose harmonic measures are singular cannot have a rectifiable subset on the common part of their boundary. Or alternatively, if two harmonic measures for two disjoint domains are absolutely continuous on some subset of the boundary, then we can find a rectifiable subset of positive measure inside this set. So in this video, we'll only focus on sketching the ideas behind the first result of Kenig, Price, and Toro. So this second result is quite technical and requires some more black box results from harmonic analysis, but it uses the same main ideas from the first result as a basis for the proof. First, we introduce some tools for talking about tangent measures of harmonic measure in NTA domains. For an NTA domain omega, recall the definition of Green's function. So it's the fundamental solution minus the harmonic extension of the fundamental solution when restricted to the boundary. And we recall two important facts that connect Green's function to harmonic measure. So the first says that the integral of any smooth, compactly supported function phi with respect to harmonic, fun uh, harmonic measure with polar x uh, where we assume that phi at x is equal to zero. So this is the same thing as integrating the Laplacian of phi against Green's function of x and y with respect to the variable y. The second fact says that given any ball on the boundary who's, uh, such that the point x is, let's say, outside the double of this ball, uh, the supremum of Green's function uh, divided by the radius of this ball, so the supremum of this function inside the ball B, is at most the density of harmonic measure in this ball. So that is to say the harmonic measure of B divided by the radius of this ball B to the power D. All right, now suppose that we have a point psi in the boundary and some sequence of radii going to zero. Now since harmonic measure is doubling, recall from our work on tangent measures that this implies that we can pass to a subsequence so that the following sequence of blowups of harmonic measure so where we renormalize the blowups by dividing by the measures of the balls in which we're blowing up, that this sequence of blowups will converge to some tangent measure, which we denote omega infinity. Now, by also scaling and composing Green's function with the inverse of these blowup maps, we obtain a sequence of blown up versions of Green's functions. So, uh, in other words, as we zoom in on harmonic measure, we're also zooming in on Green's function 
at this point in the boundary. So since Green's function is uniformly holder along the boundary, these blowups form an equicontinuous family of functions on compact sets. And so that means that we can pass to a subsequence so that they converge uniformly on all compact subsets of Euclidean space to some function u infinity. So that if we define omega infinity to be the set where this function is positive, then u infinity is a harmonic function on this domain and satisfies these two analogous um, equations with respect to the blown up version of harmonic measure, omega infinity. Now, notice that as we blow up harmonic measure, we're zooming in, and so the pole of harmonic measure that's fixed for the original harmonic measure, as we blow up, this pole is starting to drift away towards infinity. And so this function u infinity has uh, no singularity anymore, as opposed to Green's function, which did have one singularity. So omega infinity and u infinity are uh, called the harmonic measure and Green's function with poles at infinity for the domain omega infinity. So now let's start with the proof of the kennett price toros theorem. So let's suppose we have two NTA domains, omega one, omega 1 and omega 2, each of which is the complement of the other, and so they share a common boundary. So recall that we're assuming their harmonic measures are mutually absolutely continuous. So this means that we can write omega 2 as some measurable function h times omega 1. So here, when I write omega 1, what I really mean is omega sub omega 1 with respect to some pole uh, x1, but I'm just suppressing all that notation. So this implies that for almost every C in the boundary, we can find the sequence of radii going to zero. So that if omega J1 and omega J2 are the blowups of these two harmonic measures as defined on the previous slide, respectively for these two measures, then they converge tangent measures, omega infinity one and omega infinity two. And in fact, omega infinity two is just equal to uh, the density H of C times omega infinity one. Now, without loss of generality, in order to simplify some of the details, we're going to assume that h of c is exactly equal to 1. The details otherwise are exactly the same, just modulo a constant. But in this case, we then have that the two blowups are equal to each other. Now, here's the cool observation that was made in an earlier paper of Kenig and Toro, and used again in this paper. So recall that these blowups of harmonic measure are accompanied by blowups of their Green's functions as well which we call u infinity one and u infinity two, which, were, uh, which are defined on all of Euclidean space. So now we define a new function, u infinity, defined to be the difference of these two uh, functions. Um, now observe that for any smooth compactly supported function phi, if we integrate the Laplacian of phi against u infinity, okay, so this is just equal to the difference of Laplacian of phi integrated with respect to the two functions, u infinity one and u infinity two. Now we use the identity from the previous slide, which says that these are the same as integrating phi against the two blowups, omega infinity one and omega infinity two. But we're assuming that these two measures are equal to each other, which means that this difference is zero. So since this holds for all smooth compactly supported functions phi, uh, it's an exercise to show that this implies uh, u infinity is a harmonic function defined on all of Euclidean space. So in other words, what this says is that if we look at the common boundary of the original domains omega 1 and omega 2, as we blow them up with respect to this sequence of radii, they converge to the zero set of some harmonic function. Now, one can use Green's identity then to show that the blow up of harmonic measure is equal to the negative of the normal derivative of u infinity along its zero set. So if you're reading the notes, I do this step a little differently uh, to try and avoid using Green's identity, but um, this is actually how this step is done in the original paper. Now, one can actually show that uh, u infinity is not only harmonic, but it's a harmonic polynomial. Okay, so to do this, we're going to use Cauchy estimates inside a ball um, BR centered at zero of radius R. Now, if we have a multi-index alpha that's going to, uh, uh, corresponding to which partial derivatives we're taking of a function, then the supremum of the alpha derivative of U infinity in this ball BR 
is, uh, by Cauchy estimates, at most 1 over r to the length of the multi-index alpha times the average of uh, u infinity, or it should be the um, absolute value of u infinity inside this ball. Okay. Um, now, by the other estimates on the previous slide, and because u infinity is in the support of omega infinity 1 and omega infinity 2, um, there were these estimates that we can apply to u infinity 1 and u infinity 2, respectively, uh, which imply that uh, the supremum of u infinity inside this ball here is just at most um, the omega infinity 1 measure of this ball, br, divided by the radius of the ball to the power d minus 1. Now, because harmonic measure, the original harmonic measure is doubling, so are its tangent measures. So, so is this measure omega infinity one. And that means that the measure of balls centered at zero can't grow too fast, because remember the measure of the double of any ball is at most a constant times the measure of uh, the original ball. Okay, so as I double a ball, the measure changes by at most a multiplicative factor each time. So in other words, the measure of balls centered at the origin can't grow too fast as the radii go to infinity. And so in fact, you can show that for radii r bigger than one, say, the harmonic measure of this ball is at most some constant. So the constant will depend on harmonic measure of the unit ball. Uh, that's fine for us in this case. Uh, so this will be at most a constant times uh, the radius of this ball to uh, some power. So let's say, uh, this power is beta. So the measure of this ball is almost a constant times r to the beta, where this number beta depends only on the doubling constant of the original harmonic measure. So in the end, the supremum of the alpha derivative in the ball br is now at most this power of r. Okay, But if alpha is large enough, so if we're taking enough partial derivatives of u, then the power of this polynomial here, so the power that we're taking r to will be negative, and hence it will go to zero as r goes to infinity. So that means that the alpha derivatives of u infinity on all of Euclidean space, or inside any ball in, uh, centered at the origin, and hence in all of Euclidean space, must be zero if the order of alpha is large. That is to say, if we're taking too many derivatives. But that implies that u infinity is a polynomial. Now, recall that omega infinity 1 is equal to minus the normal derivative of u infinity, uh, the normal uh, minus the normal derivative of u infinity along the zero set of u infinity. And it can be shown that when you have a um, harmonic function, that its zero set is a rectifiable set. Okay, so in particular, that means that omega infinity 1 is an absolutely continuous measure. It's absolutely continuous, with, uh, sorry, it's a rectifiable measure. It's absolutely continuous with respect to Hausdorff measure. Um, and in particular, we know what its density is with respect to Hausdorff measure, and uh, its support is also a rectifiable set. So what this means then is that when we take a tangent measure of omega infinity 1, it, we can find a tangent measure of omega infinity 1 that is a flat measure. So it's a multiple of Hausdorff measure with respect to some d-dimensional plane. Now, recall the tangent measures of tangent measures of tangent measures theorem which um, which says that for almost every point C, um, the tangent measures, if we take a tangent measure of uh, omega 1 and take a tangent measure of that tangent measure, then that is a tangent measure for omega 1. So that says if we pick this point C in the boundary of omega so that uh, this bullet occurs and also so that the conclusion of the TM, TM, TM theorem holds, that implies that the tangent measure inside this intersection so the tangent measure of omega infinity 1 that's flat, that is a tangent measure for, um, for our original harmonic measure omega 1. And so thus we've shown that at almost every point C on the boundary, omega 1, so the original harmonic measure for the domain omega 1, has a flat tangent measure. So let's recap. All that work we did on the previous slide showed that almost every point C or at almost every point C in the boundary, omega 1 has a flat tangent measure. So next we'll need the following lemma that's very reminiscent of another lemma that we saw when we were studying tangent measures and prices there. So it says that if we have a tangent measure omega infinity of omega 1, 
then this tangent measure is a flat measure if the conical r distance between this tangent measure and the space of flat measures is at most epsilon for all radii less than one. So the distance between omega infinity and this cone inside every ball of radius r less than one is at most epsilon. Okay. Um, so the proof of this is a bit technical, but the idea is essentially the same as when we proved that u infinity was a harmonic polynomial on the previous slide. So let's revisit that a bit. Um, so what the assumptions of the lemma says is that omega infinity is very close to being a d-dimensional plane in large balls centered at the origin. And for epsilon close enough to zero, this means that omega, the omega infinity measure of balls centered at the origin should grow about as fast as the d-dimensional Lebesgue measure of the same balls. So in particular, the measure of any ball will be at most the, uh, some constant times the radius of the ball to some power that shouldn't be too much different than d. So in particular, it'll grow like some power beta strictly less than d plus one. Okay. Um, so repeating the same estimates from the previous slide as I've done here, um, we see that if alpha has length two, so if alpha is a multi-index of length two, or in other words, if we take any second order derivative of u infinity, then the supremum of the second order derivative in the ball br of radius r centered at zero is at most a constant times r to this power, to the minus two plus beta minus d plus one. But if beta is less than d plus one, this power is negative. And so again, this goes to zero. Thus, all second order derivatives of u infinity are zero. And so u infinity is a linear function. And then one can show using uh, this, this identity relating Green's function to harmonic measure and uh, Green's identity, for example, one can show that this implies um, harmonic measure must be a linear measure. So in other words, a flat measure. Okay, so now that we've shown this lemma, we recall a lemma from... Uh, we recall this lemma from way back when we were proving the part of Price's theorem that said that when densities of a measure exist, all tangent measures are flat. So uh, let's recall what it says. Suppose that we have a D cone F contained in another D cone M, and M has compact bases. And let's suppose that there's a radon measure mu and a point A in its supports such that all its tangent measures are in M. Um, so all its tangent measures are in M. There is at least one tangent measure in this subcone. And moreover, the limb supremum of the D1 distance between the blowups of mu and the cone F, um, this limb supremum is positive. So this happens, for example, if there exists a, a tangent measure lambda in T uh, in. So this happens if there's a tangent measure This will happen if there is a tangent measure lambda uh, that is not in the cone f. Okay. Um, then for epsilon small enough, there exists a tangent measure nu outside f, so it's distance in the conical distance in the unit ball to the cone f is equal to epsilon, and its conical distance in every ball of radius r bigger than one is at most epsilon. Okay. Now Combining these two lemmas finishes the proof of the Kenneg Price Toro theorem. So let's so here's why. So notice that omega one and the point C satisfy the conditions of the second lemma. So omega one is a measure whose tangent measures are all doubling. So we could let M, for example, just be the space of all radon measures that are uniformly doubling at the origin. Uh, if we set F equal to the cone of flat measures. Okay, then this is a cone. Um, then our assumptions say that omega one contains a tangent measure in F. So, okay, so conditions one and conditions two are satisfied. And uh, so now let's suppose, uh, so the measure doesn't satisfy the conditions yet, but uh, now let's suppose for the sake of contradiction that omega one had a tangent measure at C that wasn't flat then omega one would satisfy all three conditions because now there's a tangent measure uh, that is not inside this sub cone F, okay? Uh, then this, this second lemma says that we can find a tangent measure nu of 
uh, omega infinity, or sorry, a tangent measure nu of, so this will be tan of omega one C now. So we can find a tangent measure nu of our harmonic measure uh, so that it satisfies these two conditions here. But the first lemma then says that any blow up, any tangent measure of omega one or any tangent measure of harmonic measure in NTA domain satisfying these two conditions here. Okay, so the first lemma says that that measure must be a flat measure. Um, but this is impossible since the measure nu must have distance exactly equal to epsilon away from the cone of flat measures. So recall that f we're assuming is the cone of flat measures. So you can't have a tangent measure that is both inside the cone of flat measures and also of positive distance epsilon away from the cone of uh, flat measures. And so we get a contradiction. And therefore, all tangent measures at the point C of harmonic measure omega 1 for the NTA domain are flat. And uh, this happens at omega 1 almost every C inside the boundary. And thus, this concludes the proof of the Kennedy-Price-Toro theorem.